Ever felt lost in the world of junk journaling terms? Well, you're in the right place. Today, we're breaking down 15 junk journal terms every beginner needs to know. Stick around to discover the secrets behind terms like signature and fussy cutting. Ever wondered what those really mean and how they can transform your journaling? Well, today you get to find out. Whether you're a newbie trying to find your way or a seasoned crafter looking for more inspiration, understanding these terms is key to unleashing your full creative potential in junk journaling. I've dived deep into my journals to bring you clear, concise and fun explanations of those terms so you can spend less time guessing and more time creating. Welcome, it's Barbara from Vienna, Austria. And by the way, if you are interested in a detailed peek into these treasures behind me, you can find a playlist with a tour linked below this video. So let's get started. Number one, the signature. So a signature is a term used in bookbinding to describe a stack of nested folded papers. Several signatures are created for each book depending on how large the book needs to be. These signatures are then stacked and sewn together. It's called a signature because it's like each section is signed to be in the right order when binding. Fun fact, in book binding, groups of folded blank pages are actually called sections, while groups of folded papers with text are referred to as signatures. Bookbinders like to use the term signatures for both just because it's easier. In our junk journaling world, we can have as many signatures as we want. For example, I have these here, which only have one signature. I made these many, many years ago. They are traveler's notebook style journals. I also have this one that I made 2019. And as you can see here, this also only has one signature. But if I were to create this journal now, I would definitely split this one signature into multiple signatures to have them spread out more equally along the spine here rather than having one large chunk here at the beginning, which kind of makes no sense. But this was pretty much at the beginning of my junk journal adventure. You could of course make a junk journal with a lot of signatures. For example, this is my journal that my dear friend Louisa Heinzel made for me for Defemorember, a, a December daily series that Louisa and I host every year, as we will again this year. As you can see here, Louisa made one, two, three, four, five, six signatures. The challenge working in a journal like this is, is that when it's opened and you're working at the beginning part or the end part, <laughs> it becomes very difficult because of course you have all this bulk and when you see it from the side, you can see how challenging that would be to work on a page like this, for example. But these chunky journals definitely have their own charm. It's definitely personal preference. I would say most of my journals these days have four signatures, like you can see here. Although another very common amount of signatures that I see is three signatures. Also my planners usually have four signatures. That's because I like having three planners a year and they each have four months in them and each month is one signature. So that works out really nicely. I feel that four signatures is really nice and balanced for me. It has the right thickness and it just works for me. This here is a current journal I'm working on. And here you can see I am in the process of making two signatures. They have four pages each and these are connected with fabric pieces. So as you see, there are many options for you to connect papers. They don't always have to be 
a double page folded in half. There's many creative ways to make signatures. And if you're interested in seeing this mini series, you can find that link below this video. Number two, the binding. So the binding is how you hold your journal together. There are so many creative ways to bind your pages, each giving your journal a distinct personality. So let me show you some examples from my own journals. These two here are examples of pamphlet stitching right through the cover. Both have four signatures. I usually use embroidery thread to stitch through. You can do a three hole pamphlet stitch, a five hole pamphlet stitch. In this case, I just used a weaving stitch starting from the bottom and then weaving up and going back down. You can also do a hidden spine binding, meaning that you do not see the stitches or the binding on the outside of your cover like here. So in this case, you would first sew in your signatures onto the inside of your cover like I did here. So on the inside fabric and this also has a layer of a paper bag in between. So I stitched through those two layers first and then I added the fabric layer for the outside cover to it. There are of course many more kinds of bindings. A very beginner friendly binding is this no sew binding. Again, I used embroidery thread here. You can see I have three signatures. And instead of stitching them through the cover or on a hidden spine, they are simply put around the signatures and then they're all bound together here. And by the way, I will link videos for all of these journals I'm showing you below this video in case you want to see any of them in more detail or how I made them or even just how I created the binding for each of these. I am not the biggest fan of this kind of binding because as you can see here, they are fairly loose. So I really prefer like a firm stitched binding where nothing moves. But of course, the advantage of a binding like this is that you could more easily remove pages if you wanted to, because you could just pull them out. This makes a lot of sense if you're still working in a journal and you want to have a feeling of what it looks like when you flip the pages. You could, of course, do this kind of binding first while you're still working on it and then do a more secure binding with stitching once you have all of your pages decorated. You can also bind single pages like I've done for this one. So these were all just single pages made out of paper bags and these are bound with Coptic stitching. You see, I have a mixture here of fabric pages and paper bag pages. So this is a great method if you don't have folded pages. Again, you can find the video for this journal below. Really, really love this piece of the branch here on the side. Another option would be to have a spiral binding. This one I added using my cinch. As you can see, this is obviously a steampunk journal. It's held together here by this chain and this bulldog clip. And again, this is a way to bind single pages. If you want a full flip through or you want to know more about steampunk and how I made this journal, this was quite a while ago please check out the link below. Another way you could bind a journal is using a Japanese binding like this, which I think is super pretty. And again, it's not really difficult to do. This one didn't actually need this binding because all of these layers are held together by glue. So these are just glued together paper bags. Every single one of these pages is a paper bag, which then forms a pocket. 
this was a really fun project. It was a design team project for the Digital Collage Club. And again, you can find links to this mini series of how this is made below this video. This was really a very fun project. And finally, I also want to share this tab binding. Also a very fun option if you don't want to sew in your signatures, but you want to have secure pages. So these are just connected with glued down fabric strips. I love this journal. I've said this before. I think this might be my favorite journal that I've ever made. Again, it's a design team project for the Digital Collage Club. And what I love about this kind of tab binding is it lays absolutely flat. So again, you can find the video. I don't know if it's one or more. It might be two videos. I'm not sure now. Below this video. Number three, ephemera. Ephemera are those everyday paper items that were meant to be thrown away but have become collectibles. The word comes from Greek meaning lasting only one day which makes sense because they weren't meant to last. A typical example would be of course tickets and we junk journalers just love vintage tickets. Handmade junk journal ephemera is anything you've made to go inside your journal, such as tags, journaling cards, pockets, tuck spots, and belly bands, flip outs, and fold outs. <laughs> so even something printed from a digital kit, like this tag in here, would be considered ephemera. But of course, ephemera could also be things that we collect from our daily lives, like these receipts, for example, that I keep in this pocket. A junk mail envelope that serves as a pocket. Here I have a city map, part of Paris, or a postcard that I actually sent myself <laughs> or a brochure from a hotel. So all of these are examples of ephemera and they can be handmade or they can be collected from your everyday life. Photos can of course also be ephemera or even some tea you've brought home from your travels. <laughs> Number four, fussy cutting. So fuzzy cutting is when you carefully cut around detailed images or designs to use them as decorations. It's called fuzzy cutting because it needs a lot of attention to detail. I like fuzzy cutting images out of vintage books, for example, like this one I found at my Goodwill. This butterfly isn't going to be too hard to cut out because there's not as many details. You can choose to leave a white border, which makes it a lot easier, or you can cut right around the edge of your image, which requires a lot more precise cutting to make it look good. Something to remember when fussy cutting is that it's easier to turn the paper rather than to turn your scissors. So when you see me cutting this curve now, I'm keeping my scissors fairly straight, but I am moving the paper around. This technique makes it a lot quicker and easier to cut out your images. Also, I find it easier to first cut out the general shape, for example, like I will cut around here first and then to do the detailed cutting. So now that I have this cut off, I will go in and cut out the feelers rather than going around my image and cutting every detail as I go along. Something else you can fussy cut would be photos. So here you see a photo that I've printed on cardstock and I just cut around all of us. This was from a workshop with Alex Castro Ferreira here in Vienna, Austria. 
and look how this photo comes to life just by cutting us out rather than to just gluing the whole photo into my journal this now becomes a very fun interactive and lively piece in my journal number five distressing so distressing is all about making things look old and worn out on purpose. It's named after the distress or worn look you give to items by sanding or using aging inks. So currently I mainly use Walnut Stain Distress Ink by Ranger and Tim Holtz. But I also used a vintage photo a lot in the past. And if you want a darker distressed look you could also try the ground espresso distress oxide inks would work of course as well for example if you only want a light distressing you could use a tea dye distress ink or oxide my method is usually using a distressing tool like this with a sponge on the top you can also make these yourself there are plenty of tutorials here on YouTube. And then typically I would just take this in my hand and go around the edges like this. So now if you compare distressed look to plain look, you see this one looks a bit more aged. This one to me just looks a bit naked. Although there are styles where I actually prefer this style rather than the inked up version. If you have a smaller piece to ink up, like for example this little tag, I would use one of these finger daubers. Then that's just a lot easier with a little piece like this. But I didn't have these for many years, so you definitely can get by with just using the big tool. And if you want a softer look to your edges, because as you can see, this gives you a very distinct edge, you might want to try a makeup brush like this. And then you would put your piece of ephemera on your desk, and then in circular motions, you basically kiss your edges. <laughs> it's very romantic. <laughs> but you will see in comparison how much softer this look is. I usually don't do it, although I love the look of it, but because it takes a lot more effort, you have to put something on your desk to protect it. You need two hands. So I'm usually just lazy and I want to do it quickly. So that's why I usually do it just in my hand. So here you see, this is the softer one and this is the harder edge. Number six, die cut. So die cutting is using a shaped cutter called a die to cut materials into cool shapes. The term comes from using this die as a mold or stencil to cut out specific shapes. I like to store my dies in these plastic envelopes. And inside I have these magnetic sheets. You can find both on Amazon. I, I find this very practical because on one side I see which dies are in which envelope and by having them on these magnetic sheets they don't slide around in my envelope. Just in case you're new to die cutting let's do a quick one. So I have this book page from which I just cut out the butterfly so let's not waste the other half. Let's just quickly cut out a tag. I have this fold away die cut machine by Sizzix. There are many different brands, many different styles of die cutting machines. There's also a very small one that you could just have on your craft desk all the time, which seems very handy. I usually just roll mine through once for regular paper. And in no time at all, you have a very cute tag. So I just zoomed you out a little bit so I can show you how I store my die cuts currently. So I was lucky enough to find this beautiful vintage box at a local thrift store. 
and I just have all of my dies either in these plastic folders so I can just flip through them and the ones that come in these plastic sleeves I just keep them as they are but I have a feeling this will soon become too small so then I need to think of a new solution and I have this basket here that is always on my craft desk where I have some pre-cut die cuts and these are of course great to have on hand to either color first or use as they are or some of them I have even already added some color to and they are ready to go for embellishing my pages. This is mica stain, just so so gorgeous. And when you use dyes, please don't forget the negatives because those are super fun to use in your journals as well. Not only things like this, but also negatives like this. This would make such a cute embellishment for a pocket, for example. Obviously, I would distress the edges first, maybe add some more colors, I don't know, and then just put it on top of a pocket. Number seven, gesso. Gesso is very similar to white acrylic paint, only thinner. You can buy gesso ready-made from any art supply shop or Amazon. It dries hard, making the surface more stiff. Gesso prepares or primes the surface for other mediums, making the surface slightly textured and ready to accept other liquid mediums like acrylic paint, watercolor, distress inks, etc. Without gesso, these mediums would soak into your book pages. The word gesso actually means chalk in Italian, which is one of the ingredients. This is my current stash of gesso. These three are all white gesso. So this is my cheapest one. It's from the Dutch chain Action. It's also the thinnest one. Then I have this one from a local art store. And this is a little bit thicker than this one. Then I have this one, which is my most expensive one by the company Golden. And whoops, and it's dripping. <laughs> it's dripping because I've added water to this because I also love using gesso for white splatters. So you see here, this is not usually what it looks like, but because I added the water, I usually don't have this problem because usually it's just standing upright like this. So traditionally gesso was white, but nowadays you can also buy clear gesso like this one here from Liquitex. I really like this one because this one is very grainy. And then there's also black gesso, but, but I've never had any of that. Let me show you some examples in this beautiful journal made by my dear friend Honey. I haven't worked in this for quite a while because nowadays I generally work in my planners, but I do plan on working in this again. It has become quite bulky. So this here is a page where I used gesso here in the background. You can see it mutes the book page text underneath and you can add some color on top without it soaking into the book page. And I believe I also used it here on this journaling card here in the background. The white here you see, I believe is texture paste. Gesso is too thin to work with a stencil. And I also like using it for splatters, as I've mentioned. You can see that here. So this would be gesso. But as you can see here, one thing to notice is that when you add gesso, for example, to distress inks or oxides, the gesso will usually take on the color that you have underneath. So your white splatters will not necessarily be white splatters. So that's something to pay attention to if you're looking for really bright white splatters. Then you would probably have to seal your art piece first. Here we see the splatters in white because this is just coffee dyed paper. Number eight, altered book. So an altered book is basically a book turned into a piece of art by changing its form, look or meaning. 
It's about repurposing and giving new life to old books. I love the concept of altered books because thinking about how many beautiful vintage books land in the trash, it breaks my heart. So finding a vintage book and making a piece of art out of it that is treasured and giving it a new life, some new love, just makes me happy. I have a mini series on my channel from about two years ago called Guide to Making an Altered Book Junk Journal, which is actually quite popular. So if you want to learn more about how to tear out the pages, how many pages to tear out, how to prepare your book, what you could add to an altered book, how you can make pockets from pages within the altered book, you can find all of that in that guide. I would love to show you that journal, but I don't have it anymore. <laughs> But instead, I can show you these three. I have more than these, but I think these will illustrate the concept of an altered book well. So this was my first ever junk journal planner made out of an altered book. This is a Reader's Digest condensed book, which I found at my local thrift store. I think it was three euros. So I have taken out pages. And I have added my first planner pages here. So as you can see, I started with my first junk journal planner in July 2020. Everything was still totally handmade. Nowadays, I print all these weekly sheets and everything. So once you have all of your papers torn out, depending on how thin or thick your book pages are, you could glue book pages together to make them more sturdy. Or if you find they're sturdy enough, you can just use them as they are. And of course, by gluing more papers on top, they will become a lot more sturdy as well. So as you can see here, I have decorated the cover a bit. But of course, you don't have to decorate the cover at all. I think this is a gorgeous vintage cover. As you see, I have sewn right through the spine. Orange is not my favorite color, but I just think this is so cute. This was a junk journal that I worked in in 2019. So my style has changed quite a bit from then, I would say. But this is so much fun to look through. And the difference between this one and this one is that this one here actually still has all the original pages in. But this one, as you can see, has signatures. So this one has three signatures. And I have used some of the ori original book pages in here, but I've also added other book pages and other random pages. And then we have this one, which is again one of my planners. And this one, as you can see, I have covered completely with fabric and I added these book corners as well. So that again has a whole different look. I even added these end papers. And then here you can see the original book. Again, I tore out many of the pages, as you can see and then just glued on my monthly kits. Altered books are of course also a great option for those of you who do not enjoy or feel intimidated by sewing in your own signatures because this way obviously your book is already bound. Number nine, tags. In our junk journal world, tags are decorative labeled pieces that you can place inside pockets or attach to pages for decoration or to mark places. They've been used for ages as labels or markers. They can also serve as journaling spots or in my case for my to-do lists in my junk journal planners. You can spice them up very easily by adding a cute tag topper with fabric and ribbons. Here's one that I haven't done anything to at all. By the way, these are from my Kit Autumn Serenity. You can find my shop link below in case you want to check out any of the printables that you see here. 
This one, I would not call it tag. This one would be more of a journaling card. It does serve the same purpose in my junk journal planner. You can even add tags upside down like I did with this one. They don't always have to look in this direction. It's fun to switch it up sometimes. Again, these are more simple versions. So this one I have done nothing to except cut it out. And this one I've just added this red bow to. But then we have a more elaborate version right here. So you can go as fancy or as simple as you like. But tags can of course also be attached permanently. They don't have to be a removable piece of ephemera. So for example, this one here is sewn on the top and the bottom and then glued onto this paper bag to make it into a little belly band where I could tuck something else inside. Number 10, flips. Flips are those cool sections in your journal that you can flip or turn to reveal more content or surprise. It's like a little interactive element in your journal. This is my little jeans travel journal. This was also a design team project for the Digital Collage Club. And in here we can see an example of a flip up just by gluing fabric on the top here. And I also have many examples in this little tab bound journal that I showed you before. So we have one right here on the first page. So this is a flip and it reveals this transparent butterfly belly band with a little paper for some writing. We have a side flip also here. Again, it reveals a little notepad underneath. So again, you can find the video with this journal exactly how I made this with all the steps linked below. Here's another side flip. I think they are such a fun element. Here's another top flip. Another side flip. And as you can see, I've just attached all these flips just with some fabric that I glued down. And finally on the back we have another side flip. Number 11, tucks or tuck spots. Tucks are like little homes for your items. They're open on a few sides allowing you to tuck stuff behind. They make your journal more interactive and fun and they are different from pockets which are closed on three sides. In my videos I sometimes mix those terms up although obviously I know the difference but in the heat of the moment I will sometimes say pocket instead of tuck spot. So to demonstrate the difference this here is a pocket because it is closed on three sides and you can only add something from one side which is the top here. Whereas the tuck spot is open basically from the side and from the top. So it's only adhered on two sides in this case. And as you can see, tuck spots don't have to be made out of paper. They could be made out of beautiful vintage doilies. Even something like this can be a tuck spot because we can tuck something in. Although theoretically this would probably be a pocket, although I would never call this a pocket because it's closed on three sides, but I guess I would call this a tuck spot because it's such a wide opening and I can stick in multiple things or things in different areas rather than in just one spot like in a pocket. But as you can see the lines are a bit blurry here. <laughs> Here's another tuck spot like this. Also, this is a tuck spot. You see, I can stick things in from multiple sides. This here is my little art journal that I'm currently still working in. And here we can see, first of all, another flip out, super fun, using a business card. And this here again is a tuck spot because I have openings 
on the side here and on the top as opposed to a pocket like I have here which is closed on three sides and I can only add ephemera from the top. I think you get the idea. <laughs> Number 12, journal spread. A journal spread is when you have two facing pages in an open journal designed to be viewed together like they are one piece. It's about spreading the pages to view them together. For example here I have one theme throughout both pages so for me this would be a journal spread as opposed to this is not a classical journal it's my planner but I guess technically these would also be journal spreads because these are meant to go together. I have my calendar page here and these are my to-dos and obviously these go together so I guess I actually would call this a journal spread as well. Same thing here one theme meant to be viewed together. Maybe my planners are not the best example. <laughs> Let me find you something that I would not consider a journal spread. Maybe going back to my little art journal. So all of these pages are individual pages and they are not meant to go together. To Obviously they go together, but <laughs> they don't have one single theme throughout both pages. I hope this is making sense. But going back to another one of my planners, this here is very clearly a journal spread because of the theme I have here on both pages. Like this here, I would not consider a journal spread. And here, even though this is not necessarily on two journal pages, I would also call this a journal spread right here because this is actually one theme and it's definitely meant to be viewed as one piece of art. It's one story. Number 13, mixed media. So mixed media is like the fusion cuisine of the art world. You get to combine all sorts of artistic media in one piece and it's about mixing and matching to create diverse and exciting pieces of art. I would consider every single one of my planners and journals mixed media because we are using a mixture of different types of media. Looking at most of my journal or planner pages, you will see I have fabric, I have stitching, I have paper, I have different distress oxides, I have embossing powder, I have metal charms, I have different fibers here, more fabric used as tabs. So all of this is mixed media. So as soon as you start combining different materials, we're talking about mixed media. Although I have the feeling that mixed media is often used in a slightly different way. Sometimes I have the feeling that crafters only call mixed media the pieces that have mixed liquid media. For example, the distress oxides or paints or anything like that, texture paste, anything like that, I have the feeling is more considered mixed media. Although all of this is mixed media, even your simplest journaling page without any liquid media is going to be mixed media because most likely if you're making a junk journal you are not only using paper. Number 14, layering. So layering is super fun and in my eyes essential for making or working in junk journals. So you stack different elements on top of each other creating depth, texture and interest. It's like building a little creative world on your page or even on your cover as you can see here. So this monster of a journal <laughs> is made by dear Nadia. Nadia is Art Alalai on Instagram. I highly recommend you check out her account. She makes the most amazing journals. She also sells her journals. But I don't know how big her backlog is at the moment because I know she gets a lot of orders. Look at this beauty. I have worked in her, I think, for over two years. 
And as you can see, Nadia used a lot of layering here on the cover to give it interest, to make it more tactile and to give it more depth. I can also show you a few more examples from inside, although I think I could use any one of my journals or planners to demonstrate layering. I think here's a good example of layering of tiny pieces put together more or less randomly. What connects them, of course, is the color scheme. And I just love these little details on the page. They add so much interest. Also here in these little tuck spots, you can see both on the tags and on the tuck spot itself, I have just layered lots of little pieces of ephemera on this one as well. Here I used a die cut for my top layer and lots of more layering. And also this is a flip up <laughs> and more layering on the bottom here. I think the more layering you add, the more interest there is and the more things there are to discover on your pages. And if you're not confident of how you can layer, I would suggest to stick to a certain color range. I think it's very easy to start with neutral colors like book pages and maybe coffee or tea dyed paper. You cannot go wrong with that. By the way, here's some more gesso on the background. If you're interested in seeing a complete flip through of this journal, I have a no talking version only with music and paper sounds. And I have a version where I talk you through the individual pages. You can find those linked below this video. And finally, number 15, collage. Collage is like making a creative salad of different elements. <laughs> you get to combine various papers, photos, textiles, and other materials to create a unique piece of art. I love adding collages to my journals. And I wanted to share a few here from this altered book, which I have dedicated only to collages. I also have a video, which I will link for you below, which explains in detail, step for step, how to create cohesive collages. So you might want to check that out if you struggle. So I created this collage book in April 2020, which of course was the beginning of the pandemic. And that is also the theme of this book. You can also see it has color themes. So I have this golden yellow in basically all of my pages. And I also gave myself a prompt list to make these collages. So I just wrote down some elements I wanted to incorporate to challenge myself on these pages. And I had the best time making these collages. Of course, every collage has a lot of layering as well. Haha, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> I'd love to know which of these terms are new to you or which ones you've been using in unique ways. So don't forget to drop your thoughts in the comments below. I hope you found this guide helpful and are now buzzing with fresh inspiration. <laughs> Love you guys. Mwah, mwah.